Spanglish Generation. Welcome to another video. Today I have another personal story that I want to share with you guys. And it's the story about how our family decided to stay together when we could have had the opportunity to come to the U.S. way quicker but be apart. My father, his dream was to leave Cuba since he was very young. Since the triumph of the revolution in Cuba in 1959, my grandfather wanted my dad, his youngest son, to leave Cuba because he knew that communism really didn't hold a good future for anyone. So my dad's dream was to leave Cuba because he started suffering the consequences of living in a communist regime. His American music, the Beatles, um, Ray Conniff, all that music that he really loved to hear in his vinyl records was now illegal. So he was experiencing the shock that comes with wanting to live a free life and wanting to enjoy the regular basic things and being repressed and suffering the consequences for doing that. So my dad had it very clear that he didn't want to live in communism and he didn't want to raise a family there. But you know, as he grew, he began to practice swimming because he wanted to come swimming. My dad is a very, very good swimmer, at least he was until some time ago. Very avid swimmer, skillful and brave. But his mom's fear of him, you know, drowning or dying in the ocean, even though she knew he was very good and he had a good chance of making it, <sighs> stopped him. His mom's fear stopped him from actually taking that risk. Then my dad married my mom. He wanted to become a doctor, but to become a doctor in Cuba at that time, you actually had to belong to the Communist Party and my dad decided he wasn't going to belong to the Communist Party. So he actually left his dream to the side of becoming a doctor and he decided to become a pastor because he felt a calling to go into ministry. He gave his life to the Lord when he was 16 years old at the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Santiago. He was taken there by his mom. And so he decided to convert and he felt a calling to become a pastor. And so he went to seminar, became a pastor, waited four years to marry my mom so he could finish his studies and they married. And it was 1980 and my mom was pregnant with me when the Mariel boat lift happened. I'm going to leave a link in the description section if you are not familiar with the Mariel boat lift. So you can go ahead and take a look at that documentary. It's called Beyond the Sea and it will tell you the details of what the boat lift was, how it happened. It was the first huge exodus of Cubans on boats. So you are going to find that very interesting and I urge you to watch it. It's very, 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 very valuable and useful information, especially right now that you're trying to draw conclusions, you're trying to find information, watch Beyond the Sea. I think you're going to really appreciate it. So it was 1980, my mom was pregnant with me, and the Mariel boat lift happened. The Mariel boat lift in synthesis, Fidel opened borders. He said, come pick up your phone. You wanna leave? You're not prisoners here, who says you're prisoners? You want to leave? Bring, come, bring me a boat. I'll put your family there, you can take them. Of course, it wasn't as easy as that sounds, right? As you will notice in the documentary I'm recommending to you. My aunt that was here in the US, a very successful nurse married to a doctor, practicing both here at the time, sent a boat. She paid $10,000 to send a boat to go pick my mom, my dad, and other siblings that she had over there, another uncle, another aunt with her son, etc. So my mom said, wow, this is the best opportunity. We can leave and I could give birth in the United States. So this is our chance. She spoke with my dad and they were really excited about doing it. They were like, okay, it's our chance to go to the US. As soon as the state security, which the Departamento del Estado, the CDR leaders, which I speak about in other videos, okay? People that belong to the communist system. As soon as they heard that my parents had gotten the okay to leave in the boat lift and they had gotten a boat sent to them, repudiation acts began to happen. 
and they would wait for my mom to be alone in the house because in Cuba, the houses, the usual, the pastoral homes are usually next to the church. So they lived in a little apartment in within the church building. So they would wait for my dad to leave and they would come and yell at my mom while she was alone. They would throw sticks and stones to the windows. They would yell negro de mierda, which is you, a racial slur, basically calling my dad the N word. And they would throw rotten eggs at my mom while she was there alone, pregnant at the home. This is what communists do. They couldn't take it. They couldn't stand that the pastor and his wife had gotten the okay to leave the hell that they were going to stay in. So they began to do repudiation acts to the maggots, the husanos, because everybody that was against the regime or thought about leaving is called a gusano, a maggot. My dad found out that the church, the moment they left to the US, the church was going to be taken over by the system and it was going to be turned into a place for those people to live in. Those people meaning the CDR leaders, etc. So they were going to destroy the church. And that made my dad stop for a moment. And he had a talk with my mom. I'm talking about parents that were committed to the mission. My mom and my dad were not playing around when they gave their lives to the mission to serve the Lord. And this is, I'm not saying that they were right. I'm not saying that they were wrong. I'm saying they were committed. And you don't see that often. My mom and my dad had a very long conversation. And after agreeing what was best, they decided not to get on the boat. My aunt had paid $10,000 in 1980 to send a boat to pick up her family or part of her family. And her family was saying, we're not leaving because we don't want to leave the church to become taken over by the state and destroyed. I don't know if they made the right decision. I know God always has a plan. I just know that to them it was the right decision at the time. You can imagine my dad's dream of leaving to the, to the US since he was a little boy. My grandfather's dream was shattered. And my aunt, $10,000. Down the drain? Not really. One of my other aunts came with her son in the boat that was filled with prisoners and people suffering from mental health because Fidel took advantage and he not only let your family go on that boat, he said, bring all the people that are convicted, bring all the people that are in mental institutions and throw them in, take them too. So we didn't leave Cuba. I wasn't born yet, but I was in the belly. I existed. Eight years later, after several opportunities of my dad leaving alone through Panama, through other callings to serve the church and the mission in other countries, which he declined because he said, we go together or we do not go. As a family, we either die here, but I am not going to leave and separate our family because where my family is, is where I belong. And I admire him for that because the communist system has separated so many families that have not been able to reunite because they've left looking for a better future. I admire and I thank my dad and my mom for remaining together at all times and choosing the nucleus of the family. If we starve, we starve together. If we succeed, we succeed together. But as a family, we stick together. I'm not saying that's the right decision for everyone. It may not be, but it was for my family and I'm thankful and grateful. I'm, I'm just, I'm blessed that that's the way it happened for us. And my heart shatters for all those other people that left and couldn't reunite or left 
and then the family became secondary because once you leave, you have to understand. Not that you forget, but your life kind of moves on inevitably and you get tangled up and then your wife feels alone and she may find company in someone else. You, if you're the man and you're leaving, you may find comfort in someone else. That's the danger of separating the family. You're a human being and you could fall weak to temptation elsewhere when you've been separated two, three, four, five, six, seven years. How long are you going to wait to reunite? And when you lose hope of reuniting, that's when you fall for things that are around you that bring you comfort. And as a human, need, a human being, you need so I'm really blessed that my family made that decision that was right for us. Eight years later, 1988, almost 1989, something miraculous happened. After so many sacrifices and turning down so many opportunities that seemed to be miraculous, my mom and my dad had decided to choose family above all. And Jesse Jackson, a few years after, before, I believe it was 1970 something, I'm not sure, don't, don't quote me on that. He visited Cuba and he inquired about the clergy and why the clergy couldn't leave Cuba. And Fidel, as always, he said, what do you mean they can't leave Cuba? The same as with the vote lift. What do you mean? They're not prisoners here. They can go. They can go. And he, you know, made this whole charade and facade of, Hey, yeah, yes, you're free to go. Well, it turns out that a program opened up for a brief period of time because it never lasts. It's always a brief period of time to prove the world wrong and then just close the doors again. A program opened up for clergy families to leave Cuba if they were claimed by someone outside in the U.S., for example. So one of my dad's friend one of my dad's good friends, Alfredo Gonzalez, will always remember that name. He advocated for my father and became fully responsible financially for our family to come to the U.S. And we were one of, I believe, five families that actually flew to the U.S. Clergy families means pastors with their families that flew to the U.S., Miami, and left the airport with a green card. We got to the airport, they took our picture, they did the whole process, and we left the airport of Miami, Miami's International Airport, with a residency card, a permanent residency card. I still remember the little dress I was wearing, I had short hair, I couldn't believe it. My dad couldn't believe it. We'd waited so long. And that's how we left Cuba. I can't say that we left under conditions that put us at risk. No, I can't. Like everybody else, we couldn't bring pictures. We couldn't bring anything that was personal. I had to leave all my belongings, all my toys, everything. Um, the pictures, our photographs, our family photographs, my dad sent ahead of time with a pastor to Mexico and then the pastor sent his friend. The pastor sent them to him once he was in the US because you, they didn't allow you to take any personal belongings, rings, jewelry, photographs. That's what communists do. When you leave the country, they say, you're a traitor, you're a maggot, un gusano. Once you go, you can't, you can go if we let you, but you can't take any of your things. At least at that time, you couldn't take any of your things. But we made it. And the reason why I wanted to tell you this story is that sometimes we want something so bad. My dad wanted to live in freedom so bad. But there are things that you're still not, to, not willing to sacrifice. And to him, that was his family. Think about the things that you want. Think about the things that you really, really desire. Do you really desire them that much that you're willing to sacrifice everything? What are you not willing to sacrifice? And that which you're not willing to sacrifice is the most important thing in your life. We have to put things in perspective at times. 
and God has a perfect plan and perfect timing for everything. So don't pursue something so blindly by sacrificing that which is most important to you. Because trust me, when you put what's most important first, your dream will follow if you keep pursuing. Don't leave behind those things that you consider most important. I don't know what it is to you. To my dad, it was the family. That which is most important needs to come first. And family, in my opinion, just because the way I was raised, is to come first. Everything else will follow. I wanted to tell you that because I wanted you to get to know a little bit more about how I came to this country with my family. Because every time I say I'm from Cuba, people say, did you come on a raft? No, I didn't come on a raft. Not all Cubans come on a raft. A lot of Cubans cross the border, I may add. A lot of Cubans cross the border. They go from Cuba to another country that they can go to. They cross borders. They cross borders. <sighs> you guys, always put what matters most first. And God will do the rest to fulfill your dreams. Keep pursuing. Keep pursuing, but do not budge on that which is most important. Don't do it. Because when you achieve that dream and you don't have that which is most important, it's not going to feel so great. And you're going to realize that maybe pursuing was not the right thing. So pursue, but always putting what's most important first. God bless you. I hope you keep watching and supporting me by liking, subscribing, commenting, sharing. You guys are amazing. Love you. Now is my time to shine. Let's when your time comes, don't postpone it. When others doubt and out, you don't condone it. Truth be told, yourself is your toughest opponent. When your moment comes, grab hold and own it. Never let go.